So this is the second of our Advent series. Last week was about Anna, and this is about the shepherds. And the overall theme is one of darkness to light. How do we move from darkness to light? This is an unexpected journey. In contrast to Anna's journey from darkness to light, that one was filled with waiting and hoping and expecting. Here, for the shepherds, moving from darkness to light is about surprise. It is unexpected. It isn't looked for. It's not planned. The life is just interrupted. There was a before and there was an after. And this moment changes it and it comes as a total surprise. There's a physical darkness to the light in, in the night. But here it is the light that chases away the darkness of the night and pours joy into these shepherds' lives. I was reading a book with some friends over the last few weeks. I, I say reading, I intended to read the whole thing, but I just read the first part because I ran out of time on it. Um, but I met up with a few, a few friends a few days ago, and a friend was bringing out one of the key things that the book was saying, and it was the gift of delight, joy of being in delight. And I recalled one of the early stories that I managed to read in the book, the author Andrew Root was meeting up with a pastor to speak about what was, was difficult for him just now. And just before they really wrestled it out, they went for a walk around his, his lovely big new church, my lovely new gym hall and stuff like that. Um, and he, he describes this, this is what happened when he went into the gym hall. It was lit by late October sunshine spilling in from a dozen large windows. And the gym echoed with the laughter of about two dozen four-year-olds. Two dozen four-year-olds. Slowly pacing around a large parachute in the ground and finishing off their game. And as the parachute daily hit the floor, they all rushed past, beelining for the wall behind us, searching for the water bottles covered in cartoon characters to quench their thirst. And as they ran past us, as though we were invisible, a little girl said, as much to the universe as to anyone else, now that was great. That was great. And we laughed with delight. We stood for a few seconds in silence, just absorbing this joy and this energy. And if you've been in this place around the gateway or out in the garden at times, when the uh, car has been running some of the, the holiday clubs and things, you'll know the absolute delight and joy that rests within, within all of that. That sudden, unexpected, unplanned moment of delight and joy that they came into. I remember about the first year, maybe it was the first holiday club that we had in here, or it was a monkey business thing or something like that. And uh, I remember coming in here and uh, Anne, Anne Graham was being bounced in the parachute. That, that was utter delight and joy as well as very frightening. Um, <laughs> utter delight in seeing that. So you've made an impression on me at that point, Anne, that's never left me. <laughs> there is sudden, unexpected, unplanned moments of delight and joy that you can come into where the depressions of their conversation were suddenly abandoned to the sheer gift of joy of our four-year-old's delight that points to the journey of the shepherds from darkness into light that comes in that, in that field. God interrupted them. They weren't waiting for this. They weren't looking for God. They weren't praying or preparing or searching. But God came and interrupted them out of their darkness and suddenly, suddenly they're sharing and the light and the joy and the delight of God and what he was doing and he can share in it. I read recently somewhere about when, when you're young, it is the sad things that bring tears to your eyes. But when you're older, and I'm beginning to class myself somewhere in that older bracket somehow, when you're older, it is, it is the joyful things that bring tears. Because you sense how fragile and beautiful they are. And twice in these last two days, I felt that. Yesterday, just walking into the kindness pop-up mark, as I walked through that door into this place, the colour and the joy and the noise and the activity, I came into a happy place. And maybe that was because I also felt it so strongly the evening before at Starlight Cafe, when Karen and I were taking down one of the gazebos afterwards, which was remarkably dry for one of the first times. It was remarkably dry, and we brought it down. And as we were taking it down, 
we both spoke of these evenings as simply, profoundly happy, and we get to share in that. That is the kind of move that takes place in the fields near Bethlehem. And what matters isn't so much the darkness, but they were now in the light and they knew it. The delight and the joy that they see in this moment and the giftiness of it, the gift of the joy of this moment. So we're going to look at the beautiful openness of this wee phrase in the text, to you. And the giftiness of what is happening and then just ask what happens next. To you. The angels proclaim that this gift is to you. There is something beautifully open about this wee phrase that we don't linger on often enough, I think. And maybe it doesn't help that this, in English, when you say you, you don't know whether it's singular or plural. And maybe we need a wee bit of Scots in there to make the point. All yous. All yous. I remember a famous line from my grandfather spoken on the beach at St Andrews when the whole family were wrestling with whether to go into town for lunch or stay a bit longer. We were wrestling over this big question on the beach. And he gave us this immortal line. All yous is go on, all yous go go on. All yous is go on, all yous go go on. And sometimes we need that emphasis of the plural to know that we're really dealing with what we're really dealing with when we hear the word you. This is such a beautifully open word from the angels on the hillside that are spoken to the shepherds. I don't think we sit with the openness of this enough. Let it roll around in your head a bit longer. This word is spoken to all of you, to me and to you. It's not restricted this gift. What this gift is, is being given to you. And just let that fall on your heart this morning. There are any number of reasons, I suspect, why the angels come to the shepherds on the hill to share this glorious news. But one reason echoes through this wee phrase to you, that the gift is for every one of us. Whatever our life, our circumstances, our experience is, this is a gift that comes to you. When everything is ordinary and every day, this is a gift that comes to you. The good news comes to the shepherds when everything is just as it is, just as it always was, just as it will be, when nothing is expected to change. Suddenly, God interrupts and everything changes. But it begins here in a hillside when everything is ordinary, every day, what we're used to. So if your life is just where it is, God can interrupt that. Change it. I mentioned last week that I'm springing this Advent series off some of the writing of Stephen Cottrell in his book Walking Backwards to Christmas. And in the chapter on the shepherds, he gets into the heart of the sense of things being very ordinary before God interrupts their life, when the light and the joy comes. And he pictures a, a shepherd called David. I don't know where he got that name from. A picture called David, a shepherd in the hill. And he says this. This is him picturing himself in, on the, fu- in the field. There are noises. Sometimes a frightened lamb will bleat. One of us will roam around the perimeter of the field, check out our makeshift fences, looking out for foxes and bears. And we shout to each other, just grunts of acknowledgement that all is well, no assistance is required. Or else somebody's snoring as their body caves into sleep. Sometimes they're prodding them awake. Sometimes there's a haunting hoot of an owl. And it's a sheep are, sheep are stupid things. They require constant attention. They wander hither and thither. Whoever offers a lead, they submit to that. The fragrance of well parsed there a sprig of time. Just leads them off a cliff. They're daft. They need taken care of. When one is lost, someone needs to seek it out. There's nothing in all that that suggests God is about to happen. Shepherds aren't looking out for God. They're not waiting on God. They're not searching and praying like animals. They're not expecting God to be in this moment in the hillside. And I suspect that we're very good at being in that place of life just happening, of it going in the way that I know it's going to go. But I know roughly what's going to happen next, what tomorrow will will bring. We know the pattern of our lives. And maybe we're not really looking for God to interrupt that too much. Whatever we may say, we kind of, we know what we like. Happy with that. But then there is this gift, this song of joy that opens up and the shepherds hear it. The word's spoken to them, to you. This gift is given to you, shepherds. That invitation of sharing the delight of the four-year-old that my friend spoke of in the book, that awareness of gift in a happy place, these are wee tokens of this overwhelming delight and joy that that pours in these shepherds now. And I think, I think, I think, 
I don't need to be in a special place for God to meet me. I don't need to be doing special things for God to meet me. There is not a life that is being lived that God cannot interrupt. Whatever it is we're doing, however we're making our living, whatever we're doing to make our life, God can open us up to his delight and his joy and his living and his gift, his glory of Jesus in this wonderful, beautiful wee phrase of a gift that is offered to you, that is good news to you this morning. That our Saviour is born. An invitation, come into the light, come into the delight, come into the joy of this gift. God comes to us in the everydayness of our lives and says, how you And this is sheer, utter gift into our everyday lives. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. A saviour is born. This gift is not simply of the mode of telling, but of the gift itself. Jesus is born. The one who will bring you peace is here. He is born and a gift to each one of us. I used a line from a poem on Thursday at Renew Wellbeing within our prayers at big points. And I haven't really been able to let go of this line since I, since I shared it. Maybe it's because life feels very busy just now. And there's a line by Boyd W.H. Auden that speaks of Jesus. And I think at Advent when I hear this line, I immediately am in the stable, seeing this moment. And this is, this is the line. At the still point of the turning world, sitting at the still point of the turning world, our life is very busy just now. There's a lot that takes place in our lives, being pulled in different directions. And this gifted, surprising moment in the hillside is an invitation to go to that stillness. To read through the, the wider poem is to be aware of everything moving, of life moving, of unsettling and it's restless and it's unstable. And yet in this line, he points us to where peace has been born. Points us to what can hold but everything is spinning. If we put it into the language of the psalmist, it's the place where you know this truth. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. Still place in a restless world. Now, I, I'm going to apologise immediately for this terrible use of language I'm about to, to share. But if it works, then I'll, then I'll use it. When I, when I spoke of the world as feeling unstable, and shortly after mentioning the stable, the contrast is too good to let go. An unstable world go to the stable. It's a very bad dad joke, but sometimes they need to be said, and there is a truth in it. This is an unstable world. Go to the stable. There is peace, there is a still point in a turning world. And what do the shepherds do with this, this gift of this mode? What happens next? Well, they run to Jesus and they begin to share the joy of it. Those who are here are amazed at what's happening. And we're maybe not in a dark hillside looking after sheep, but maybe our lives are stuck in patterns where we need God to just interrupt them and call us to the stable again, to, to the birth of the one who brings peace. What would, what would we do with that call? If God shouts from the hillside in the darkness and just interrupts our life, what would we do with that call, that interruption from God? Would we set it aside so that we can just do our everyday stuff? Or let our lives find a new centre, be gifted again into the newness of what God has done in us? Stephen Cottrell again writes of the moment when the shepherds responded to this interruption from God and and turned towards the stable and came into this place of stillness. He says, but what a silence in that stable. The silence of being loved and of loving, of knowing and being known. We went into the stable and the door wasn't barred, it was open to us. And as opposed to the whole waiting world, we went in and we knelt down, that's all we did. Fools and idiots who for no reason of personal merit or insight just received the richest fortune. We knew this. We didn't need to do anything. These days over Christmas, they'll be busy. No getting away from the sense of the world turning, of things moving, of much to do. But this 
This is God's interruption into our lives. Come again to the stable, to the place where peace is born. Your peace, peace that is for you, for all of you, the place where Jesus is born, our Saviour. Come to the stable and rest in that place. You don't need to say anything. You just rest in the stillness of being loved and loving the gift of this moment of joy and delights. The Lord says, come to this place and find peace. And let that joy be shared and go back out. Shall we pray?